Good afternoon. I realized uh, only this morning, uh, through a lack of diligence on my part, uh, that my charge is to introduce Derek Hamilton as well as Sandy Darity. It's a bit more challenging in Derek's case because we only uh, just met. He is the associate director of the Cook Center, a professor at the New School, a student of Sandy Darity's, and a stratification economist with a prolific record of analysis and advocacy, including pioneering work on the need for a federal job guarantee, a vital initiative which I'm pleased to mention because I've only just taken it up myself. To go a bit further back in time, I'm just old enough to remember and even to have participated in as a 16-year-old, the convergence of the civil rights movement, the labor movement, and the peace movement that was blown apart in the acts of violence of April, June, and August 1968. It was in the aftermath of that, not all that long by the standards of current perspective, in the fall of 1974, that I first met Sandy Darity in London as we arrived for graduate study on our marshals. I saw him then, and a lifetime of later experience has confirmed, as one of the brightest, most wide-ranging, brave and lucid intellects it would ever be my pleasure to know. Born in Norfolk, raised in Amherst, Sandy passed through MIT and into academic life well before I did. I poached his syllabus when I uh, started teaching and taught from it for about 15 years. We wrote a remarkable, unique, progressive, and highly unsuccessful textbook together. <laughs> and I have... Uh, tracked and mostly mute admiration his work on everything uh, from economic theory to the mid-Atlantic slave trade to the persistent disparities of race and gender. In the course of his hegira, Sandy has taught in more places than I can list, but most recently he wisely abandoned the Carrie C. Bosheimer Chair in Economics at UNC to become the Arts and Sciences Professor of Public Policy at Duke, a fitting title for a scholar of his range, and welcome at long last to our little club. But most of all, I know Sandy Darity as a friend, a teacher, and a patron of great distinction, an honest person with a warm and open mind, and the man who taught me to write out all talks in longhand on yellow pads. <laughs> it is therefore my great pleasure to yield the floor to him and to Derek Har Hamilton now. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, it's, it's, actually, it's a thrill to actually have you here. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I'd also like to, uh, to, to say that at the outset that uh, much of my presentation today is going to be anchored in a, a single chapter of a book that I'm working on with my partner, Kirsten Mullen. It's a book called From Here to Equality, and it is on the case for reparations for black Americans. Uh, and uh, I, uh, please don't ask me when the book will be out, but uh, we, we hope within due time, okay? Uh, I also would like to, uh, to thank Kai Zhao, the Statistical Research Associate at the Cook Center, and Mark Paul, our postdoctoral fellow. Uh, they've been collaborating with Derek Hamilton and myself on a number of projects, and it's their insights and efforts that also inform 
some of the presentation that you're going to, to be hearing today. I'd like to begin with the observation that one of the unfortunate dimensions of the standard case for black reparations is an exclusive emphasis on slavery as the pertinent atrocity that justifies reparations. But what about the record of atrocities during the 150 years since the formal end of slavery? Tanasi Coates's resurrection of the conversation about reparations is strikingly relevant because Tanasi attempted to make a case for reparations that was anchored exclusively on events that took place during the course of the 20th century. And that's going to be the focus of my conversation with you today, not just the 20th century, but the entire sweep of time since slavery ended. And I also want to emphasize that the unjust treatment of blacks that's going to be cataloged in some depth in the conversation today is a, is a pattern of unjust treatment that is a national problem. And it's always been a national problem. It is not exclusively a problem of the American South. And so uh, to begin the process, and I'll never do this correctly, let's, here we go. To begin the process, I want to share this slide with you which is a, an image of the Ku Klux Klan marching on East Main Street in Ashland, Oregon in the 1920s. And Oregon has a particularly troubling history that, uh, that I would like to claim is illustrative of a set of the issues that uh, I'd like to pursue with you today. Whites who migrated to present-day Oregon during the 1840s and 1850s typically were very much against slavery but they were simultaneously against living with black folks. On September 21st, 1849, the, transition, the, the, tran the territorial legislature passed a law that said, it shall not be lawful for any Negro or mulatto to enter into or reside in Oregon. Uh, the preamble to the law indicated that Negroes might intermix with Indians, instilling into their minds feelings of hostility towards the white race. Now, uh, I guess this presumes that the native population didn't have any independent reasons for having hostility towards the white race. The clause was rendered moot by the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, but it was not actually repealed until 1926, and other infelicitous language was removed from Oregon's charter in 2002. But let me say this, even though this, uh, this, 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 uh, this law that was passed in 1849 was not ferociously enforced, it was relatively effective. As of 1860, the census indicates that there were 128 black people living in Oregon out of a population of 52,465. And today, blacks constitute about 2% of Oregon's population. Uh, you've probably heard references to the phenomenon of sundown towns. These are towns where black folks had best be out of the town by the time the sun goes down. I've also used that phrase metaphorically to describe academic departments that have never had a black faculty member. I refer to them as sundown academic departments. <laughs> but what's intriguing about Oregon is Oregon constituted a sundown state. And, uh, and, and so uh, I, I just wanted to indicate that we had a sundown state in the far northwest, uh, and this is a, a region of the country that could not necessarily be more physically distant from the southern part of the United States. So let me begin the conversation with a series of indictments. The first indictment must be the failure to fulfill the promise of the grant of 40 acres and a mule to families who had been enslaved. Had that promise been made, had the ex-slaves been given a substantial endowment in southern real estate, it is likely that there would be no need for reparations to be under consideration today. 
The 40 acres were to be allocated roughly to families of four. Therefore, each ex-slave should have received 10 acres of land. Since there were approximately 4 million ex-slaves, a total of 40 million acres of land should have been allocated to the formerly enslaved black community. Uh, with the now, while the allocation of 40 acres was not actually made, black American farmers managed to amass 16 to 19 million acres of land by dint of their own efforts by 1910. Still less than half the amount the ex-slaves should have received during Reconstruction, but not insubstantial. This was a peak of ownership by black farmers in the United States, with 218,000 farmers as full or partial owners of land. By 1997, black farm land ownership had diminished to a mere 2.4 million acres. Today, the top five white landowners in the United States own more land than the whole of black America's population, and apparently Ted Turner alone possesses the equivalent of one quarter of the entire acreage of land in the possession of black Americans. Murders of African American landowners for the purpose of appropriating their property and the coerced public sale of family land resulted in the rapid decline of black American land ownership in the 20th century, and it continues to decline further in the 21st century. Now, the failure to grant the ex-slaves an initial stake in American property ownership and subsequent sustained land taking from blacks has contributed to the comprehensive denial of black wealth accumulation. Apart from the barriers to land ownership, Black home ownership was restricted by discriminatory redlining, differential access to government finance for home mortgages, and most recently, by the subprime mortgage crisis engendered by loan pushing by the banking system. So not only were blacks not given the promised 40 acres and a mule after the Civil War ended, but a white terror campaign that included assassinations of black elected officials, freedmen, and their white allies throughout the South prevented blacks from exercising their right to vote. A black state senator and prominent delegate to the post-Civil War South Carolina Constitutional Convention, Benjamin F. Randolph, a staunch advocate of black suffrage and education, and the publisher and co-editor of the Charleston Advocate, a newspaper for freedmen was executed by the Ku Klux Klan at a train depot in Hodges, South Carolina in 1868. The Klan executed white North Carolina State Senator John W. Stevens in a courthouse in Yanceyville in 1870. Stevens had been, had been a member of both the Republican Party and the Union League. A former Confederate, Stevens' efforts to organize blacks in Caswell County, North Carolina obviously inflamed the white supremacists. These attitudes produce the conditions for an intense and systematic level of white supremacist political violence throughout the states of the former con Confederacy. This was particularly true in the states where Republican Party dominance persisted as late as 1874, almost a decade after the end of the war. These states were Louisiana, Florida, South Carolina, and Mississippi. Terrorist white supremacy organizations, including the Ku Klux Klan and the Red Shirts, emerged and became brutally active across the South, intent upon restoring the old racial hierarchy. Intimidation of black voters with gun and noose became the norm. By 1876, when Union troops were removed entirely from the Southern states, the die was cast. With rare exception, the right to vote was quashed for blacks, leading Bennett to conclude, Leron, Leron Bennett to conclude, soon the Civil War would be sucked of all meaning and would become an agency of reconciliation between the North and the South. Political intimidation, economic exclusion, and the erasure of communities where blacks had attained some measure of affluence were the customary aims of a wave of massacres conducted by whites from the 1870s well into the 1940s. Among the very earliest in the post-Civil War period were the Memphis Riot of 1866, 
the brutal attacks conducted by the White League in Colfax in 1873 and Cushata in 1874 in Louisiana. The White Riot in Danville, Virginia took place in 1883, followed by an even more destructive bloodbath that took place two years after Plessy, the 1898 massacre in Wilmington, North Carolina. Planned in advance, and systematically encouraged by white supremacist agitation, the goal of the Wilmington Massacre was the overthrow of the Republican elected municipal government. The plotters were drawn from the best social class of the city's white people, most visibly including Alfred Waddell, a former Confederate Army colonel who installed himself as mayor after the uprising. In all of these cases, local police forces were implicated as agents of violence and extermination directed against blacks. In all of these cases, uh, in all of these cases, there was some direct or indirect attempt to eliminate black political authority or black political participation altogether from the process of decision making in these municipalities. White supremacists who fomented the Atlanta riot that took place in September 1906 and led to dozens of black deaths patterned their vigilante assault explicitly after the tactics pursued by the conspirators, conspirators in Wilmington. In 1970, 1917, excuse me, East St. Louis, Illinois was engulfed by white destruction. And in the aftermath of World War I and the Bolshevik Revolution, the grisly red summer of 1919 witnessed murderous assaults on black communities in dozens of towns and cities, including Elaine, Arkansas, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Norfolk, Virginia, Omaha, Nebraska, Charleston, South Carolina, and Bisbee, Arizona. The horrific 1921 massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma, raised the prosperous black Green, Greenwood community, a so-called Black Wall Street, and included the dropping of incendiary devices on black homes and businesses. The white riot depicted in the 1997 film, Rosewood, took place in 1923 in a small town of the same name. But the white violence in Rosewood was only one of many instances in the bloody state of Florida during the first two decades in the 20th century. Throughout the 20th century, America was characterized by a long and extensive lynching trail, a pathway of extra-legal executions of blacks. The most recent estimates place the number of blacks murdered by white gangs and mobs between 1877 and 1950 at close to 4,000 in the states of Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Virginia. Kentucky, the only one among the 12 where enslaved persons represented less than 25% of its overall population, was the only state among these that did not secede from the Union. And these numbers of lynchings of blacks do not include approximately 300 more that took place outside of the South. Occasionally, lynching, lynching frenzies overlapped with white massacres. For example, 237 blacks were lynched in Elaine, Arkansas during the 1919 white riot. At times, lynchings also were associated directly with the expropriation of black-owned land, and the threat of lynching also created a climate of intimidation that promoted black subordination. Although there are still numerous instances of extrajudicial executions conducted by private citizens, today's lynching trail is dominated by police killings of unarmed black men and women. Among the approximately 1,000 persons now killed by the police each year, one quarter are black Americans, a proportion far greater than their presence in the overall population. This annual level of black executions exceeds virtually the number of lynchings in any year of the first half of the 20th century. A common attribute of all of these murders is the failure to convict the perpetrators of a crime Rarely are they even prosecuted. Indeed, there is an unbroken pattern of failed prosecution of perpetrators from the clandestine murder of Emmett Till to the execution of Michael Brown in the streets of Missouri. The ongoing destruction of comparatively affluent black communities no longer is achieved by white riots, but by a more subtle form of violence. First, urban renewal, 
and second gentrification. Both processes have been described sarcastically as Negro removal. Black neighborhoods produced under the constraints imposed by white preferences for residential segregation often develop stable middle-income communities and black-owned business districts. Nevertheless, these Jim Crow neighborhoods still have been subjected to demolition. Indeed, uh, in, the, uh, in, in the specific case of Miami, Florida, where we've seen the, the, the film Moonlight uh, describing Liberty City, Liberty City is actually a part of what's called the Overtown District. And the Overtown District was bisected by a federal highway, which destroyed the character of the community, and it also eliminated a substantial business district there. Uh, this was not uh, an uncommon experience. The Federal Interstate Highway Program also was deployed uh, to situate new freeways that ran through the heart of black communities, again disrupting established neighborhoods, displacing residents, and destroying black-owned business districts. This happened north, south, east, and west in the United States. Now, while urban renewal constituted a process of Negro removal engineered by the public sector, gentrification constitutes a process of Negro removal engineered by the private sector with public sector complicity. Gentrification involves the displacement of low and moderate income blacks from neighborhoods where they have lived for generations by affluent whites. In many instances, whites are, in quotes, reclaiming America's inner cities. This process frequently is coupled with the demolition of the high-rise public housing buildings that were built after the leveling of black-owned single detached homes, the substitution of public and low-income housing with mixed-income housing, and the continued designation of predominantly black communities as areas that require economic renewal and development. In short, the black population literally is pushed out of their homes and neighborhoods. Another dimension of the indignities that are visited upon uh, black Americans are associated with the mechanisms of segregation. One of the examples of segregation, and there are multiple, but one of the examples was the, uh, uh, the construction of separate uh, water fountains. So um, a few years ago, we did a major project comparing the status of blacks in the United States with Dalits and tribals in India. And so sometimes I refer to Dalits and tribals as India, in India as the, as the blacks of India, but sometimes I refer to black Americans in the United States as the untouchables of America. And, uh, and there's a, a, clear, a, a clear pattern that's quite similar. Uh, in the Indian context, the local village well is a contested territory and the Dalits are frequently denied access to the water from the local village well. And so this is actually a very similar kind of pattern that occurred in the United States. Now the question I want to pose is, I, I think we're, we're familiar now with the concept of microaggressions. Uh, I, the question I want to pose is whether or not this is a macroaggression or a microaggression, <laughs> okay. Uh, but but uh, let's, let's <laughs> define a microaggression as an indignity that's visited upon folks where their life and limb are their life and limb are not directly are not directly threatened. So uh, the, the the primary objective and effect is is to damage your emotional spirit. Okay. So we could have a series of these microaggressions, all associated with the way in which segregation would operate, which could have the cumulative effect of truly damaging individuals' health. Uh, and, and, and we're now absolutely convinced that the higher levels of hypertension that are present in the African American community are, are primarily attributable to uh, racialized stress. And this is uh, a foundation point for the kinds of racialized stress that continues to operate today. But another profound dimension of the devaluation of black lives that has been the direct product of public policy is the maintenance of separate and unequal schools. The formal structure of Jim Crow schooling did not end until 1954 with the Supreme Court's Brown versus Board decision. The pursuit of massive resistance to the court's decision by the states of the old Confederacy meant that genuine school desegregation did not get underway until the 1970s. 
The dual school system ensured racial differences in the quality of school facilities, in teacher compensation per pupil, and in the quality of instructional materials. The magnitude of these disparities first, uh, first was documented carefully by Horace Mann Bond in his classic study, The Education of the Negro in the American Social Order. And Horace Mann Bond was uh, Julian Bond's father. Uh, Bond detailed the widespread practice of paying black teachers significantly less than white teachers. Frequently under the dual system, the black-white teacher uh, ratio of teacher salaries was 60% or less. These huge disparities in teacher pay could not be explained fully by differences in teacher training. The economic historian Robert Margo has estimated that both in 1910 and 1940, about 80% of the difference in black and white teacher pay was due to sheer racial differences in compensation established on pay schedules by local white dominated school boards. This was out and out discrimination. But at least as pernicious are patterns of within school segregation that result in the assignment of black students to the least challenging and least engaging curricula and instruction. Racialized tracking is the culprit. Indeed, teachers, particularly white teachers who function as the primary gatekeepers in gifted identification, are less likely to refer black students for gifted programs than white students with similar levels of academic achievement. The persistence of wage and employment discrimination and racial wealth inequality ensures that America's die are loaded against blacks in two ways. Not only do blacks have reduced opportunities to obtain, obtain quality education, but there is less of a payoff for any credential that they earn. Racial differences in earnings for MBA recipients from the same schools grow to enormous levels over a short span of time. For example, Black MBAs from the Harvard Business School start their post-degree careers earning about $5,000 less than their white peers. Within six to eight years of graduation, the racial pay differential approaches $100,000. Bloomberg data demonstrates that the industry in which pay is most inequitable by race and gender is finance. Tony Business Schools like Harvard, Columbia and the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, of course, send the largest proportion of their graduates to the financial sector. A recent audit study of more than 1,000 positions advertised on a national job search website using racialized names is especially revealing. Despite the fact that a credential from an elite, highly selective university improves the employer response rate, White candidates from less selective schools received as strong a response rate as black candidates from, from more selective schools. In addition, when employers did respond, they offered black candidates lower initial salaries and lower status positions than white candidates with comparable or even inferior educational credentials. Moreover, blacks with a college degree have a mere two-thirds of the median net worth held by whites who never finished high school, and blacks who are working full-time have a lower median net worth than whites who are unemployed. The last thing that I'd like to mention before turning the microphone over to, to Derek is the phenomenon of the thoroughgoing devaluation of black lives. And I'd like to make mention of the use of black bodies for medical experimentation, starting with the development of gynecological instrumentation in the 1840s through to, uh, through to experiments like the one that took place in Tuskegee, where a group of black men were left untreated for syphilis for many, many years for the purposes, uh, according to the scientists who conducted the experiment, for the purposes of enabling them to observe the progression of the disease. Uh, in 1958, when the surviving participants were given certificates of merit, even at that stage, they were not told that they had a disease for which they were not being adequately treated. And, uh, we, we finally had an acknowledgement and apology for the Tuskegee syphilis experiment under Bill Clinton, but of course uh, the Bill Clinton administration trafficked heavily in symbolism, so there was no substantive compensation that was offered to any of the, the still living victims. 
And the last thing I want to mention in this context is the phenomenon of forced sterilization of black women, uh, particularly uh, in instances where physicians would say to women that they would not provide them with uh, additional medical services unless they agreed to have their tubes tied uh, among black women who were recipients of some form of, of, of welfare from the federal government. So that this is a coercive process of sterilization far removed from personal choice. When the United Nations Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent issued their dramatic report calling for reparations for black Americans in 2016, they emphasize current injustices as well as enslavement and its long-term effects. As the Washington Post reported, in particular, the legacy of colonial history, enslavement, racial subordination and segregation, racial terrorism and racial inequality in the United States remains a serious challenge as there has been no real commitment to reparations and to truth and reconciliation for people of African descent, the report stated. Contemporary police killings and the trauma that they create are reminiscent of the past racial terror of lynching. I, I would go a step further. I'd say they are exactly analogous with the past racial terror of lynching. Citing the past year spate of police officers killing unarmed African-American Amer African men, the panel warned against impunity for state violence, which has created, in its words, a human rights crisis that must be addressed as a matter of urgency. So I'll pick up from here. Um, I guess I'm going to continue with a conversation around the political economy of the state of black America 150 years after emancipation. I'm going to start with an indictment of my profession, the economics profession, which I think is the intellectual thought for a lot of the policies that might exist, as well as the, the rhetoric around describing inequality. And then I'm going to end with a set of alternative policies that Sandy and several people in this room and I have been engaged in. So the Reverend Dr. William Barber describes economic justice as a moral imperative. The sentiment is in contrast with our emergent economic priorities around budget austerity and economic growth, which ironically are often at odds with one another, while economic equity, fairness, and human capabilities take a distant backseat. The economic profession and its so-called positivist approach and free market dogma are culpable in advancing this paradigm. This is based on a faith that markets are somehow natural, transparent, efficient, and inevitable. The belief does not give enough attention to the political actions that form and codify markets in the first place. Markets, whether they're product markets, labor markets, or financial markets, are presumed to be self-regulating. The most astute, the most valued, and the hardest workers are believed to prosper and endure, while the least astute, least valued, and laziest are presumed to receive their just rewards and simply fade away or have to do something else. These presumptions pay little attention to the roles of power and initial endowment, e.g. capital or wealth, and how that capital and power can adjust to alter the rules and structures of transactions and markets to privilege power and capital in the first place. It is silly to presume that those with power and capital are simply price takers. Particularly relevant for today, the economics profession has also fallen short in its understanding of the role of group identity, e.g. race, as it relates to material and psychological well-being. This is crucial for our understanding of the state of black America 150 years after emancipation. For the most part, economists view <coughs> identity and prejudice as an exogenously determined binary that represents preferences, taste, bigotry, or ignorance. It ignores the agency and benefits that individuals have in choosing and investing in a collective group identity and how social structures may increase or decrease the value and incentives to invest in that identity. Without such an analysis, the economics profession is more than complicit in the continued trajectory of racial stratification. Nonetheless, the long, this long trend towards inequality is not without tension. The, shockingly re, the shocking results of the past election 
seem to represent at least a rebellion, albeit far from a full overthrow of the current system. However, if the election is viewed from the perspective of a stratification economist or a critical race theorist, the results are less, sat less surprising. President Trump's campaign slogan of making America great again and the signal, right, the make America great again was a clear signal of a time when white relative hierarchy, white male relative hierarchy was at its peak. His other campaign slogan was, I'm your last chance. That was with clear overtures to the pending demographic shift and when white, in which whites will no longer be a numerical majority. All of that was about codifying the property rights and whiteness. Some political pundits have offered an alternative explanation and attributed Trump's stunning victory to an economic populism. However, exit polls are not consistent with an economic populist mandate. The majority of households in the lowest demo income demographic group, those earning $50,000 or less, voted for Secretary Hillary Clinton. While no candidate attained a clear majority of votes, vote, votes in any other economic group. Granted, the less than $50,000 income bracket is the one that has the greatest proportion of non-whites. Um, but nonetheless, this election was more about race than class. This leads to a key question with regards to the tenuous relationship between racial divisions amongst the working class and, and racial coalition building to address their collective worsening economic condition. So here's the question. Are the white privilege benefits and protect, protections that accrue to white workers as a result of exclusionary and discriminatory practices that codify the property rights and whiteness, are they greater than the reduced labor bargaining power costs that result from a smaller and more fragmented labor movement and having to compete with a reserve army of black and other subaltern unemployed workers? I think that's a key question. So two things are unambiguous, un unambiguous from this form of racial stratification. First, black workers are made worse off. Second, the capitalist class, which is overwhelmingly white, is made better off. What is ambiguous is the position of that white working class worker. Um, white privilege offers both psychological and material benefits, and we should recognize that. This frame fits with Herbert Blummer's 1958 thesis that race prejudice exists basically in a sense of group position rather than a set of feelings which members of one racial group have towards members of another racial group. Basically, group relative position transcends individual feelings. Some of the more tangible examples of property rights and whiteness include the fact that blacks who live in families where they had graduated from college, as Sandy pointed out, typically have less wealth than whites where the head dropped out of high school. Um, other examples would be Diva Pager study, which indicates that when employers are signaled by workers that have a prior criminal record, white workers that signal that prior criminal record have a greater likelihood of callback than black workers who did not. Another signal of, another indicator of the property rights and whiteness would be the fact that black expected mothers who have a college degree have a greater likelihood of an infant mortality than white expectant mothers who dropped out of high school. But let's consider some historical trends of racial disparity. <coughs> Prior to 1940, the US Census did not collect wage and earnings data. But since then, there's a consensus amongst economists that there's been dramatic reductions in the black-white labor market disparity. In 1940, the typical black male earned less than 45% of what was earned by a, a white male wor worker. By 1980, that disparity had fallen such that the typical black male now earns about a little over 70% of what the typical white male earns. The explanations to explain this tremendous decline include improvements in overall labor market conditions resulting from rapid growth of the post-World War II period, particularly in manufacturing production, the great migration of blacks away from the less prosperous southern and rural areas to more prosperous northern and urban areas, as well as an overall growth in southern wages in general, the substantial increase in both the quantity and quality of schooling for blacks, and particularly important, reductions in labor market discrimination resulting from the civil rights legislation, anti-discrimination enforcement, 
and affirmative action policies. Regardless of reason, this progress at the very least stalled by the mid-1970s. The worsening economic progress prompted economists John Brown and Richard, Richard Friedman to ask in 1992, what went wrong? <laughs> so they posit two broad explanations. First, the environment for black achievement worsened. And second, the federal government priorities shifted away from a legislation and enforcement of anti-discrimination policies, which led to a heightening of labor market discrimination against black Americans. So we'd be remiss to, dis to discuss labor market disparities without mention of mass incarceration. Since 1970, there's been at least a seven-fold increase from about 200,000 to about 1.5 million inmates in state and federal prisons. And this is not counting the approximate 700,000 individuals that are in county and local jails. A disproportionate share of this incarceration are blacks. Black males make up about 6% of the U.S. population, but roughly half of the incarcerated population. And you all have probably heard that the black male lifetime likelihood of being incarcerated is about <coughs> one in three. Nonetheless, there is a striking paradox that's at odd with the worsening environment for black achievement argument. Why is it that high achieving black Americans, typically measured by education, still exhibit large economic disparities relative to their white peers. There's a recent report by Janelle Jones and John Schmidt entitled, The College Degree is No Guarantee. It indicates that the unemployment rate for black recent college graduates exceeds 12% and is as high as 10% for those black graduates who have a STEM major. Over the past 40 years, regardless of education, the black unemployment rate has remained roughly twice that of white Americans, and rarely has that rate dipped below 8%. So if 8% is a demarcation of calamity, black Americans are in a perpetual state of economic crises. Turning to wealth, which is the paramount indication of, indicator of economic well-being, it's also the indicator of the most dramatic black-white inequality. We know that wealth provides financial agency over one's lives, it provides the economic security to take risk and shield against loss. It provides what the Nobel laureate economist Amartya Sen has referred to as a human capabilities approach to development. Basically, wealth allows individuals to be self-determining in defining and attaining their <coughs> self-defined goals. So blacks make up about 13% of the U.S. population, but own less than 4% of the nation's private wealth. The absolute racial wealth gap exceeds $100,000. The typical black family owns about eight cents for every dollar owned by the typical white family. And if we're to look at liquid assets and remove retirement savings, the typical black household has a $25 cushion to deal with any financial emergency that might occur. $25 <coughs> is not enough to feed a family of four for one day. If we add retirement savings, it moves to $200. In essence, all right, in spite of these enormous disparities, the presumption remains that if blacks were more responsible, made better financial decisions, and were more focused on education, they could get a good job and pursue a pathway towards economic security. In our research brief entitled, Umbrellas Don't Make It Rain, Why Studying Hard and Working Hard is Not Enough for, for Black Americans, we demonstrate the statistics that Sandy cited to you earlier, that a black family with a college education only has two-thirds that of a white family that dropped out of high school. And furthermore, for those with, with a college degree, a typical white family has $180,000 in net worth. That's about 800% higher than that of a black family with a college degree. In essence, education is not the anecdote for the enormous racial gaps in wealth and employment. None of this is intended to diminish the value of education. Obviously, there's clear intrinsic value to education, along with a public responsibility to give everyone a high-quality education that teaches them to synthesize and fuse information into big ideas with encouraging teachings trained to deliver a curriculum from grade school all the way through college. Another one of our reports entitled Bootstraps are for Black Kids, and that's with Yanju Nam as the lead author, 
It documents that black parents with more limited resource display a greater inclination to provide financial support for their adult children, education, than their white counterparts. We, we find that the median wealth for black parents who provide financial support for their adult child is about $25,000, whereas that's substantially less than the $74,000 median value for white families that did not provide any resource for their adult child to go to college. It is a myth that black families don't value education, but also, also problematic is the societal overemphasis <coughs> on the economic returns to education as the panacea to address socially established structural barriers of racial economic inclusion. So I'm going to quote a little bit from Barack Obama's 2013 commencement speech in Morehouse College in which he invoked black American legacy of triumph triumphant leaders who without excuse were able to overcome tremendous structural barriers and achieve great things. He says, you now hail from a lineage and legacy of immeasurable strong men, men who bore the tremendous burdens and still laid the stones for the path on which we walk. You wear the mantle of Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, Ralph Bunch, Langston Hughes, George Washington Carver, Ralph Abernathy, and Thurgood Marshall, and yes, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. These men were many things to many people, and they knew full well the role that racism played in their lives. But when it came to their own accomplishments and sense of purpose, they had no time for excuses. The president continues his inspirational speech to these elite black males at a historically black college and university by stating, every one of you have a grandmother or an uncle or a parent who's told you that at some point in life, as an African American, you have to work twice as hard as anyone else if you want to get by. So I'm going to make the case that that's part of the problem. Because I ask, at what cost are there economic and health consequences associated with above normal effort for these highly educated, racially stigmatized black graduates in a context of a racially stratified America? Their physical and psychological cost of stigma, and ironically exerting individual agency, which in the context of these stigmatized environments may explain the limited role of education and income as protective factors for black Americans relative to their white peers. The added effects of, of stigma imposed on high achieving blacks that threaten the relative position of the dominant white group may translate into deleterious health and economic condition for those high achieving blacks. The prevalence of a neoliberal and post-racial thought both framed in the politics of personal responsibility, they emphasize things like individual agency, particularly self-investments and education as the pathway towards economic mobility and efficient social distribution, well, that might literally be bad for the health of black Americans. Despite the persistent and enormous racial disparity cited above, again, the public sentiment is that the civil rights period, which outlawed most forms of blatant de jure discrimination, has largely led to an elimination of structural racial barriers. Ultimately, the focus of policy as a result of this becomes the rehabilitation of the black American family to address remaining racial disparity. It is as if the passage of civil rights legislation moved us from conventional explanations of racial disparity evolving from biological to those that are now cultural, cultural determinism. This political discourse is upheld by Democrats, Republicans, blacks and whites alike, it emphasizes, again, education, motivation, and personal responsibility. <coughs> the personal responsibility and post-racial discourse cited above minimizes the role of race and accentuates three things. One, the civil rights period removed largely transcended racial divide. Two, the remaining disparities are the result of actions or inactions on the part of blacks. And three, this is the one that I think we should be cognizant of. There's nothing particular about the oppression experienced by black Americans. Some people have called this multicultural neoliberalism. <laughs> and I think the president, in his famous Philadelphia speech, More Perfect Union, vividly exemplifies this. I'm going to quote a portion of it. 
former President Barack Obama. He says, it also means binding our particular grievances for better health care, better schools, and better jobs to the larger aspirations of all Americans. The white woman struggling to break the glass ceiling. The white man who's been laid off. The immigrant trying to feed his family. It means taking full responsibility for our own lives. So this all follows from a neoliberal perspective where the free market, as long as individual agents are properly incentivized, is supposed to be the solution to all our problems, whether they're economic or otherwise. Political scientists Joe, Foss, Joe Soss, Richard Fording, and Sanford Tram, in their seminal book, Disciplining the Poor, they describe an emergent neoliberal paternalism where the state serves a paradoxical role of structuring most aspects of society to adhere to a laissez-faire market tenant, while at the same time serving the role of poverty governance. Here the state uses incentives and sanctions to coerce and discipline the underclass, not working to eliminate poverty, but rather to manage seemingly bad behavior with increasingly punitive tactics. Stigmatization based on race provides the political fodder to implement harsh and punitive controls of the underclass. Because of the marginalized social status and overrepresentation in poverty for blacks, they become the symbolism by which the surplus population, <coughs> characterized as persistently unemployed, unemployable, a source of urban crime and malice, and whose subsistence is a drain on public budgets, that's how the surplus population gets defined. The neoliberal paternalistic frame provides the rationale for austerity policies. If behavioral modifications, particularly with regards to personal and human capital investment is a central issue, why fund government agencies and programs which at best misallocate resources to irresponsible individuals and at worst create dependencies that further fuel irresponsible behavior? So I think I'm, I'm going to try to go through a little quick because I might be running out of time. The late black economist Nobel laureate Sir Arthur Lewis, in his book, Racial Conflict and Economic Development, offered an explanation of how the dominant group maintains their social hierarchical position. Dominant groups tend to use privilege and power to limit subaltern group members' access to skills and credentials in the pre-market stage so as to ultimately render them non-competing at the market stage. Lewis describes two strategies when subaltern group members, like blacks, are able to acquire credentials in the market stage. He says the dominant group response may be one, first to change the credential criteria <laughs> at the market stage, basically change the rules in the middle of the game. The second is simply to discriminate. Competing members of the subaltern group that become more competitive, as been pointed out by Sandy Darity, might face a functionality of discrimination where discrimination actually intensifies for them. So I'm going to move on and just get to a set of policies that might come about from this neoliberal perspective in contrast to a set of policies that might come, out, come about from a field that Sandy and I have been engaged in trying to develop, stratification economics. So here are some neoliberal policies to manage surplus populations. They go as far back as the British poor laws of the 19th century. They include income maintenance programs. They include social isolation, basically segregation. They include military conscription policies, mass incarceration, policies aimed at controlling the reproduction, fertility, and family formation of the surplus population. And Sandy cited several of those. And then lastly, surplus populations are particularly vulnerable to social experimentation, including the Tuskegee syphilis experiment or something that's more relevant in the news today, the moving to opportunity experiment. In contrast, uh, here's a 10-point stratification economics approach. <laughs> One is reparations. Reparations for slavery, Jim Crow, and the exclusion, from, exclusion of blacks from the New Deal and post-World War II policies that built a white asset-based middle class. Two, baby bonds. The program is analogous to a social security program for young adults, it provides seed capital at birth that's held in a federal trust for which they can use when they become <coughs> an adult to purchase the economic security of an asset 
that can build a lifetime of security over the course of their life. An asset like a home, like seed capital to start a business, or debt-free college education. Federal job guarantee. It offers the economic security of a living wage to all citizens, investment in public and physical, public, physical, and human infrastructure. It provides an implicit floor on wages, as well as other worker amenities. It provides jobs for socially stigmatized workers, and it increases the bargaining power for all workers, regardless of whether they receive the federal job guarantee, by removing the threat of unemployment. Number four, federalized credit scores. A metric so determinate in individual lives should not be left in the hands of the private for-profit sector. It should be transparent. It should have the accountability that goes along with being an elected official. Number five, postal banking. It provides banking services, short and long-term loans, particularly for underprivileged individuals who financially have to rely on predatory lending, including check cashing institutions and payday lenders. Basically, it provides a floor on financial products that will be available for the American populace. Number six, EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, should be proactive in conducting employment audits similar to how HUD used to do, in detecting discrimination, racial discrimination, as well as other forms of discrimination, and then they should prosecute discriminating firms. And this should be especially true for firms that receive federal funds. Number seven, federal subsidy to HBCUs to the tune of the present value of support reached by other colleges and universities from post-World War II GI Bill Right. Ira Katz Nelson, the historian, historian, estimates that that finance represented something that would have been of equivalent order to what was used by the Marshall Plan to develop Europe. What is evident is that blacks in university settings still need stereotype safe environments to mitigate racial hostility and provide curriculum that's more relevant to their experiences. Number eight, eliminate tracking in grade school and offer universal so-called talented and gifted programming to all students. Number nine, single-payer health insurance. In my view, the fundamental flaw of Obamacare is that it did not have a public option. Number 10, stop mass incarceration, especially of nonviolent offenders. Hold police criminally and civilly responsible for abusive police practice. And then also legalize marijuana. Those would be a 10-point platform, I think, that could bring bring us to greater <laughs> racial inclusion and economic justice. <laughs> so despite of the social and political emphasis on education as the means of social mobility, the evidence is clear that when family background is controlled, blacks actually acquire more edu educational credentials than their white peers, but it's equally clear that they reap less economic and health benefits from those, economic, from those education credentials. So let's change this paradigm. Once and for all, let's eliminate social structures where individuals from socially stigmatized groups have to, in President Obama's words, work twice as hard just to get by. Instead, let's heed the words of Dr. Reverend William Barber and make economic justice a moral imperative, and let's seize the mantra to fulfill Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr and President Frederick Delano Roosevelt's vision of an economic bill of rights and ultimately offer all Americans the economic security, dignity, and justice to achieve their self-determined goals. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? We do have time? Okay. Uh, we'll be glad to try to answer questions that uh, folks have. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you for these really inspiring um, points. One question I had was, I know critical race theory talks about the role of interest convergence in terms of getting some of these um, agenda items done. So I'm wondering how, if at all, um, you've thought about how do we actually work in this political context and which of these uh, initiatives would be the ones that we could actually get done through something like interest convergence. Okay. You want me to try that one? Okay. So one of the points I was trying to highlight is that 
oftentimes we like to describe how equity is a model by which we can achieve great economic growth. One concern with that is that it's not always true. We can cite periods in, of, in American history in which we've had exploitation leading to high levels of economic growth. The concern and the point is, and this is perhaps where we have interest convergence, let's change that whole paradigm and redefine what we call economic health. But also something that we, if we're going to be, I guess in my view, straight up honest, it's not always the case that we might have interest conversions with some of these, these groups. There, there might not be in some instances. But to really answer your question, there are several policies that were mentioned in that list, such as single-payer health insurance, such as a federal job guarantee. Um, frankly, the only one that was race-specific was reparations. reparations. Yeah. But every one, in the, every one of the other policies in there would be examples, in my mind, of interest conversions and consistent with a critical race theorist lens that could be achieved. A, a language that I like to use and like to, that I shifted from, I used to say things like targeted universalism. And John Powell, you know, he, he might have, I think he coined that phrase. Um, targeted universalism, the way I think John Powell applies it, is the right way to apply it, but it can be cannibalized. It can be cannibalized into a language where we address poverty issues, and because of black overrepresentation in poverty is, in, in that poverty realm, they will disproportionately benefit. Well, that does nothing to address a lot of the points that we made in the presentation today of the racial stratification for those blacks that are able to receive credentials. So a term that I think we, I would recommend that we adopt to and move towards is that of um, Richard Reeves and Elizabeth Sawhill from um, the Brookings Institute, where they talk about race-conscious universal policies, or we can even say race and gender-conscious universal policies, where we are clear that we're going to be conscious of these stigmatized groups, but we also can pursue universal policies. Basically, I think it's important to have the word race in there. Hi. Uh, so my question, and, and I guess it's kind of taking up on where you're leaving, Derek, around being very explicit that these are racialized policies. And I guess I'm curious about how you think about getting buy-in or getting policies passed. Um, so we know that there is, at least with some policies, a perception that once, if they're benefiting black people, right, support dwindles. So for instance, some white people who are highly critical of Obamacare love the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, uh, you know, my mother's from, or I'm from Georgia, we're in the Deep South, and my mother says all the time, that some of these poor white people are starved to death, right, in order to not do something that they think is helping black people. So I'm wondering, given this explicit, this is helping black people, you know, it benefits everyone, potentially lots of folks can benefit from this, but how do you overcome that kind of psychic investment in whiteness? So you may not. Uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, people always raise this puzzle about mm -hmm. whether or not so-called working class or low-income whites are voting against their own self-interest. Mm -hmm. But if their self-interest includes maintaining mm -hmm a particular level of social status distance That's right. with blacks, then it's not clear that they're consistently right. voting against their self-interest. So unless we can change that perception, mm -hmm. and, and there are some material reasons why that perception could mm -hmm. be held. I mean, as Derek pointed out, mm -hmm. uh, blacks with a college degree have two-thirds of the net worth of whites who never finished high school. Mm -hmm. uh, the health conditions of whites at every level of education are significantly better than that of blacks. The prospect of having a safe encounter with the police is much greater if you're white, regardless of your income level. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so there's some material benefits associated with the preservation of the status of whiteness. And so we may not be able to change those attitudes. So the question is, 
can we get buy-in for a social program to improve national well-being from a sufficient portion of the white population to make this happen. And I've been using the 40% figure because I think that's approximately the proportion of folks who were white who voted for Barack Obama in, in a moment in which people were highly optimistic about the consequences of his, of his presidency. So, um, so there, there, I'm, I'm saying something a little bit different. You know, there may be some folks you never can make your allies, mm -hmm. and so you have to proceed without them. Oh, I don't care about allies. I was just thinking practically from a policy. I mean, I sorry, and well, I, don't, I, mean, I don't. I don't really care about white people' feelings and attitudes and such. I'm just thinking yeah, yeah. about practically from the policy standpoint. I think that's well. Well, that, that's 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 yeah. my point. That yeah. we would need to get about forty percent of the white American population to be at least moderately enthusiastic about this agenda. Just enthusiastic enough. Yes, yes. just enthusiastic okay. enough. And, and, you know, I'll add, we got to worry about black people as well. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, absolutely, 13% of black men voted for Donald Trump. I'm not even thinking. I'm, I mean, I'm just many, thinking. 90% voted for Barack Obama, and I'm arguing Barack Obama's part of the problem. Well, Barack <laughs> Obama. I'm, I'm, let me just finish uh, real quick. Is this whole neoliberal paradigm that we're mm -hmm. in, this whole way in which we define how rewards are determined, mm -hmm. Um, the whole way in which we define um, what our economic priorities are going to be. We need an overthrow of that. that. That's, I think, the we need to move to a period of rhetoric where we change the rhetoric. We redefine what it means for us to be a healthy economy. Until we get there, I don't think we are going to change. And I'm, and I'm going to reiterate again, black people are buying into these narratives. Oh, we other other black people because the, the norms of capitalism are very appealing. It's very appealing to think that you have agency and that you can change your lot in life if you just do this, that, and the other. And if it's not true, right, we're stuck there. We just need to change that, that whole thought process. Thank you both. Thank you. I debated on whether or not I was going to come up here and ask this question, but I've listened. Um, one of the things that I'm not hearing is we need to take responsibility for ourselves. Most of our dollars go outside of our community. We do not support our own black businesses. We come out of college and we decide that we're going to go into white America and we're going to get that watch at the end of the day or we're going to break that glass ceiling. Why aren't we, as young black people, coming out of college with these education, instead of crying about how much money we're not making, going out there and doing the things that we know that we're capable of doing and supporting each other and building our own businesses and stop taking our dollars outside of our community because that's one of the biggest problems that we're having. We're giving our money away. And I understand about reparation and that 40 acres and a mule, but I also am living in reality. Everybody wasn't supposed to get that 40 acres and a mule. I've read uh, what they said in, um, about Sherman's uh, uh, proclamation about some of those people in Georgia and South Carolina were going to get it. Everybody wasn't going to get it. There was a time before desegregation where we had businesses, where we had our own banks, we had our own insurance companies. We supported each other. Until we get to that point where we start spending our dollars in our community and supporting our own businesses and making sure our children get the best education that we possibly can and taking responsibility for having good, healthy areas where we don't have food deserts and medical deserts and taking care of each other, we're going to keep talking about this and talking about this. It is not the government's responsibility to take care of us. We need to start taking care of ourselves. Okay, so my question is, did you hear my presentation? <laughs> I did. I'm I quite did. serious. Did you I, hear I did, my I presentation? Did, I did hear your presentation. And because I the point I of my presentation. I absolutely agree with you. But then the I central hear point this. of my presentation was that, indeed, there was a period where black folks developed healthier communities under the rubric of seg segregation. Mm -hmm that there was the development of certain black institutions, and these institutions, these prosperous communities, were systematically destroyed. 
And so as a consequence, we cannot talk about black folks being responsible for the economic conditions that we I are confronted totally with today. I totally agree with you. I understand So the personal responsibility narrative is precisely the narrative that Derek and I have been trying to challenge in our conversation today. And holding our elected officials responsible. Because I understand what you're saying about Tulsa. I understand what you're saying about all of these communities that an urban renewal and the plan that came along with urban renewal that in 30 or 40 years, we're gonna take this land that we already, that the uh, system was gonna take that land back. They did it in Washington, D.C., they did it in Chicago, they did it in St. Louis, in they Memphis, did it in Michigan Tennessee. City, Indiana, yep. every place. They knew exactly what they were going to do. However, we need to hold the people that we elect to represent us responsible, and when they don't, we don't sit down and say, oh, well, we well, go, no, we go nothing, back. Nothing have we said is a, is a suggestion that we believe, oh, well. In fact, uh, you know, people frequently complain about the, uh, the younger activists not having a social program for change. They, they say that the, the participants in Black Lives Matter don't really have a program. They say that the participants in BYP 100 don't have a program. Actually, they do have a, a, a well-developed agenda for social change with very specific policies that they have in mind. That's very different from saying, let's just sit on our hands. That's saying that we need a set of social policies that have to be fresh, innovative, and transformative to bring about a change in the society. And that 10-point program that Derek talked about is an illustration or an example of that same set of policies that would have an effect. The key thing is this, we cannot talk about closing the racial achievement gap in the United States without some program of racial redistribution of wealth, okay? It is not something that black people can actualize through their own energy and activities because the magnitude of the disparities are so enormous now as a consequence of the entire set of historical processes that I talked about. If we are concerned about the development of black self-employment, black businesses and the like, you cannot have any sustained success in those opportunities or enterprises unless you have an initial level of wealth to provide you with the capacity to try to start new businesses and to maintain them. So we have to have some mechanism of redistribution. And one of the things that Derek and I've talked about with the baby bonds proposal is a notion of redistribution of wealth without confiscation. I mean, that's a key dimension of the baby bonds proposal. But that's not a race-specific proposal. It doesn't address the historical injustices that have confronted black Americans. That will require a reparations program. Hello. Um, so, um, I mean, in a way, part of what is um, appealing and and um, and part of the tension between the, what you both presented and what the previous commenter talked about is that there are two competing moral arguments, right, um, that are that are behind this conversation about reparations. Um, and so, the historical half that you open with is one of those sort of. Um, moral openings that make us, rem that remind us like, well, there's all these injustices that must be corrected, right? Um, and so, um, and so that's, just, so that's, I, I do think there is something to think about there, about how we are making moral arguments as we are also making economic ones, right? Um, and, and on that point, part of what made the Reconstruction Amendments possible was having come out of a crisis, right? Um, being the Civil War. Um, and I wonder if the kinds of policies that we're thinking about here would require something of a moral crisis equivalent to war. And I don't mean an actual like war, but I mean that an understanding that we are in a kind of crisis that requires something that would create this kind of redistribution, right? Um, and so I wonder um, if, you, if you guys see a, a like if this is a, a if we, we need to introduce these policies in a kind of gradualist um, way to sort of um, 
to make it work within like certain policy programs that already exist Can within certain this? parties, or if we need to present it as an entire package um, with the with the proposal that we are in a crisis um, brought about because of the historical legacies of, of, of slavery and the failures of Reconstruction. So I think we're always making uh, a moral argument. Uh, when we choose to do nothing, that's a moral argument. It's a moral argument in favor of maintaining a status quo that might be <laughs> inequitable and unjust. Uh, I think that one of the reasons, I, I think we are in a crisis, mm -hmm. right? I, I mean, a national crisis. I mean, we're in, in a crisis of, of, of growing proportions in terms of the presence of a, a political regime that uh, is, is antithetical to many of the things that uh, some of us in here value deeply. So, uh, and, and I don't think we would have gotten into this position if we had not been gradualist mm. in our approach, if we had not been incrementalist. If previous administrations had pursued far more dramatic policy actions, I don't think that we would be in the crisis we're in today. So I think that we really have no choice but to be bold and aggressive in terms of designing alternatives. And so if we have a package, and it's a powerful package, we should try to see if we can get all of the package enacted. If not, uh, we'll go with what can be. But, uh, but I think we need to present it as a full-scale program for change. I don't know. A couple of points I'll add. Um, <laughs> I agree, we always are making moral decisions, and we should own up to it and be explicit. Part of the problem is the narrative that economics as a discipline is a so-called science without morals, but rather being a positivist, hmm. positivist discipline. I think that's problematic because it's not true, and it also somehow makes being moral bastardized as somehow being uh, you know, a, political sci a political economist as if that's a bad word. Uh, the second argument, the second point I wanted to make is I also think we have to be careful when thinking about previous injustice and the need for, for morals not to fall into the trap of multicultural paternalism that I, that I tried to emphasize that there's nothing unique or special that everybody has some form of stigmatization. Identities are, are multi, but some identities are stronger than others. They're intersectional, but even an intersectional identity, some some identities are pervasive. Um, so to kind of dovetail off of that, um, I was wondering how you guys kind of conceive a reparations program, especially with respect to, um, I think that uh, neoliberalism has a very shallow conception of race and see, views race through just skin color. Um, whereas I, I would think that race, I think you guys have presented that race is much more than that. It's much more of a lineage, and uh, your class, all, all of these other attributes. Um, so how would you view a reparations um, program with respect to immigrant populations that may, um, I guess, look like or look similar to um, um, the historical uh, slave descendant black populations? Uh, you thought a lot about that. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and, and uh, Kirsten Mullen and I have thought a lot about that. And we think that, uh, you know, one of the things that we have to consider is uh, the question of whether or not the nation state is the anchor site for making claims for reparations. If we accept the premise that the nation state is the anchor site for making claims for reparations, and, you know, people may not accept that, but if, if we do take that as a given, then the appropriate claimants in the United States are those individuals who are descended from communities of folk who were subjected to the injustices that took place in the U.S. context. So if individuals are going to be eligible for the reparations program in the United States, uh, a reparations program that's targeted at the history of injustice directed against blacks, which may be different from a reparations program that would be targeted for Native Americans who would be subjected to a somewhat different set of injustices. But, uh, but, but a black reparations program, the folks who, who would be eligible for the program should have two characteristics. One, they should be individuals who are descended from somebody who was enslaved in the United States. And second, 
For at least 10 years prior to the onset of the reparations program, they should have self-identified as black, Negro, colored, or African American. Uh, and, the, and the latter condition, obviously, is in place to prevent people from running up and saying that they're black once we have a reparations program in place. Uh, and so, so those are the two conditions. But I would, I would think that individuals who are more recent immigrants from other parts of the world, that the sites for their claims have to be another set of nation states. So, for example, individuals who have migrated to the United States from the, the former British West Indies, the obvious source of their claim would be uh, the UK. Uh, for individuals who are from Haiti, there is a claim that must be made against France because it turns out that Haiti actually paid France compensation. Okay? Uh, and then uh, the various countries of the African continent I think they should lodge their claims against the former colonial powers that control their destinies and their lives. So, so, so my thinking is if you start with the premise that the nation state is the locus for the claim, then you have to determine which social groups have particular claims against specific nation states. So I, I, let me just make one quick, oh no, I'm sorry, go ahead, sorry, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Hi. I just want to say, thank you so much. This has been wonderful, incredible. Um, I just had a question. I was really curious about the issuing of uh, credit scores by the government, um, and the governments themselves are subject to privatized. I mean, to, the credit scores. The credit scoring system is privatized, and the the governments themselves are subject to that. Um, to that, to that scoring system. So I was just curious how you, how you uh, conceptualize that. And uh, when I left off working with black legislators and lobbyists, um, they were in discussions about forcing um, credit companies to add um, you know, things like payments on utility bills and things that uh, people systematically do all the time that could positively affect their credit scores but are never taken into account. So what would be maybe some of the benefits of, of forcing them to uh, incorporate more information into the credit score versus having the government take over that entire credit score system? I think that's a great question. Um, I can't remember the person's name. He just won a MacArthur Award and he has worked with some credit agencies or coming up, come up with shadow measures of of credit for consumers where he included things like rent payments on time and other factors to try to come up with a, with a better metric. So I'm all in favor of programs like that. I also want to make the point that um, I have no problem with Moody's rating corporations or even rating governments with regards to, to their ability to pay back. At issue is the vulnerable consumer. That, that's what I'm arguing the issue. And I, and I think that you're going to get a principal agent problem if you just leave it in the hands of the for-profit private sector. Now, my proposal to have, or our proposal to have the government federalize credit scores is not without potential issues. Um, for instance, we know that right now when people are coming back into the country that they're open to being surveyed, sur sur uh, surveillance on their social networks. Show me your phone and let's look and see what's in your phone. Um, no, that's being used in my mind for not always good purposes. Because you, you can end up alienating people when you start looking at. <laughs> I have more to say about him, too. <laughs> Is that the, the voice of God? There you go. <laughs> Let's look at the statistics. A familiar voice. <laughs> I, I guess it is, it is telling me that I'm being long winded. I'm, I'm Basically, it might not be a perfect measure, but there needs to be some accountability, and we need to address the principal agent problem. And I'd much rather the government be involved in it than the private sector. And I know we're about to end, but, and Sandy might have comments too, but before we end, I want to not only thank Jamie Galbraith for the introduction, but also point out that his book, and this is a shout out to it, his book, The Predator State, was one of the books that exposed me that being caught up in Democrat or Republican pro pro parties might not be the real issue. In the <laughs> book, he talks about how both parties have evolved to what he's characterized, he can do it much more eloquent than me, a predator state, where when they're in office, they might be enriching their own uh, I don't know if he used this term, cronies at that time, 
But there is a paradigm that we're in that we need to change regardless of political party that's in the White House. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful presentations this afternoon. So one thing I think that's missing for me in terms of this analysis, um, and maybe it's there and I, maybe I just missed it, when you're looking at the harms that have been inflicted on these communities over time for so long, what was missing for me was the experience in, the, in terms of judicial, so what's missing is the harm caused by judicial, by the, our judicial system. And so let me give you my perspective on how I've experienced the judicial system. The harm that has been experienced is that the Supreme Court has created a test under the Constitution analysis that requires what they call strict scrutiny, scrutiny for anything related to race. And then for issues re related to gender it's intermediate in terms of strict analysis. I'm going to talk to make it easier for the interpreter. Um, um, in the the, what's missing for me is a discussion about the harm of jurisprudence as it relates to the African American community and other identities that are in this community as well. So for example, the Supreme Court had a constitutional analysis um, on issues related to race. They're, they apply the constitutional test of strict scrutiny. Mm -hmm. When they're issues related to gender, they apply the test of intermediate scrutiny. And issues related to disability, for example, is the rational basis test. Now we know that all communities have all these identities. There, I don't know if we have critical legal scholars here because they may also be able to help with answering this question. Mm -hmm. um, but what's missing for me is that you have a really great set of policy ideas. And I can see, Dr. Garrity, that you are constructing um, a standard of evidence that you hope would meet a, a Supreme Court scrutiny of any policy change we would ask for that could survive scrutiny by the Supreme Court. Now, what's very interesting is you very carefully, <coughs> Dr. Hamilton, ha laid out all of the variables of what has been the impact of macro and microaggressions on the community that are related to health, that are related to employment. And one of the things that I would look at this and say, these are all disabling conditions. Now, why do I tell you that? Because here's the trick. If you frame something as a re policy response that will affect people with disabilities, the only test you have to meet is that it's a rational basis test. So that's just about anything under the sun if it's a good idea. There's no bearing whatsoever on a narrowly tailored test because that's the burden that any reparations argument is going to have. Because all any opposing counsel has to prove is that there were enough descendants of slaves that have made it, so to speak, and so why do reparation? There's not narrowly tailored enough. So, and it's not enough to just identify over a period of 10 years, right? So my question to you is, this is where I keep get, you know, stumbling. Um, because the one thing that we were in the disability community were able to benefit from when the ADA was passed in 1990 is what I call an affirmative duty was created in the law from our experience with the Civil Rights Act. What was missing in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was um, it prohibited discrimination, but later on affirmative action was created to create an affirmative duty. Well, the Supreme Court had completely deconstructed that argument. Now, the ADA came through and Thankfully, and I don't want to talk too much about this because there's some risk to, right? <coughs> but we were able to get affirmative duty embedded in the law and it's been accepted that now when I come to a conference, 
it's, you know, uh, funded by a university, you fall under the ADA, you have to provide a sign language interpreter to compensate for the communication um, uh, environment. And really, the interpreter, really, there's much for you as it is for me. So what's interesting is now um, the ADA has that affirmative duty. If we tried to put that back into the Civil Rights Act, the Supreme Court it would put us through an impossible set of hoops to jump through. So when I think about the policy and I think about the argument, how do you grapple with that? And we'd have to address the Supreme Court logic in order to deconstruct any of this. And if for a case to get through, we'd have to turn the logic on its head almost to say, to achieve a lower um, standard of review to get anything through. So how would you do that? So I'm just curious if you've given thought to that. I spend a lot of time thinking about this, but I'm very curious to your response. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a, a phenomenally important question. I don't know if folks know that this is uh, Dr. Cardona, who's the president of Gallaudet University. Um, but this is a, a phenomenal question. Um, I, I guess I want to start from a different angle, which is uh, my prior is that there's something fundamentally wrong with the, uh, with the Supreme Court engaging in judicial review in the first place. That that is fundamentally undemocratic and that that uh, authority, which was seized, I believe, under the Marbury versus Madison case, uh, that that authority is one that is not legitimate, but it has been exercised for many, many years in the United States. And it leads to a situation where there's a, a kind of a, a, an ambiguous feeling about the court, because sometimes people perceive the court as being their ally, and sometimes they don't. And I think in the historical context of thinking about black Americans, uh, the court has mostly not been an ally. Uh, you know, if we, if we go back to, uh, uh, if we go back to the Dred Scott decision in 1856, Plessy versus Ferguson, finally is overturned by the 1954 Brown decision. But if we look at the way in which the philosophical case was made for overturning Plessy versus Ferguson, there are serious problems. Um, and now the Supreme Court has become a, a, a systematic uh, obstacle to the exercise of affirmative action. So you're raising the question about if we were able to succeed legislatively in adopting a, a reparations program, would it survive a challenge in the courts? And uh, I, you know, the, 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 the answer is uh, it, 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 it probably wouldn't with the court current, as, uh, with a currently constituted court in the aftermath of the selection of Supreme Court justices by President Trump. But this is all, this is all a matter of, of, of almost whimsy uh, because it, it's simply a matter of who is sitting on the court. There's the, the court's capacity to engage in dis, judicial review is a capacity that is independent of the substance of the law. Okay, I know there's some legal scholars here, but I, I, I think that you know, the courts, the judges do what the judges believe in. Uh, and, and, and then uh, precedent is smoke and mirrors. Okay, so, uh, so, so we have to address the question of, as long as we let the court engage in judicial review, then we have to ask the question of how do we influence who is actually on the court. And, uh, and there are moments when I say we should have a constitutional amendment so that we elect our Supreme Court justices. <laughs> I guess, well, one more point also is if we look in an international context, even if laws are enacted or constitutions are enacted to address some of these identity inequities, like the case of India um, and Dalits, uh, that doesn't even guarantee enforcement. So there, there's even the risk of we go through passing laws in a democratic election, yeah. and that also doesn't necessarily guarantee that we end up with the outcome that we desire. On that dismal note. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.